Senate Bill 510 passes with some issues attached. Dietitians in the supermarket, how to sell healthy and a connection between water, weight and shopping. For today, Wednesday, December 1st, 2010, this is Food News Today. Good morning. In our top story today, we take a look at the Senate's passage of Senate Bill 510 and the implications. Immediately following this webcast, we continue with a live discussion in our chat room below. Please join us. If you're unable to participate in the live chat forum, feel free to email me directly, phil at supermarketguru.com. Food News Today is sponsored by ConAgra Foods, who shares with me the desire to provide the most current, interesting, and unbiased food news. After much controversy and discussion, the bill passed yesterday morning in a 73 to 25 vote. The Senate Bill 510 will now be passed on to the House of Representatives for its approval. It is the first time in 70 years that Congress has updated the nation's food safety system. While much of the reports have pointed to the recent outbreaks of salmonella and E. coli, the bill does much, much more. One of the most important changes is that the bill now allows the FDA to order a recall. Currently, the agency can only suggest that action to food companies and for them to conduct a voluntary recall. In addition, the bill requires larger food processors and manufacturers to actually register with the FDA and to create detailed food safety plans. The bill does not apply to meat, poultry, or processed eggs, which are regulated by the Agriculture Department. The bill had stalled over the past few weeks for regulations for small farmers and producers. An amendment introduced by Senator John Tester of Montana provides scale-appropriate food safety rules for small and mid-sized farms, and local processors who gross under a half a million dollars per year and who sell at least 50 percent of their foodstuffs directly to consumers, local retailers, or restaurants. While compromise was reached by senators agreeing to exempt these operations from the expensive operational food safety plans that's required of large companies, we feel that this could be a significant problem in the future and that all food processors, large and small, must adhere to the same strict regulations if we are to improve our food safety. Exempting anyone who produces foods from the new federal HACCP requirements or produce safety standards puts people at risk. The other major features of the bill include, finally, coming to a definition of local, where local restaurants and retailers, as those who are either in-state or within 275 miles of the facility or farm its sources, products from. Extending what most of us loosely define local as being 100 miles from the source. FDA to create new produce safety regulations for producers of the highest risk fruits and vegetables. Increasing inspections of domestic and foreign food facilities and redirecting financial resources to those operations with the highest risk profiles. Establishing stricter standards for the safety of imported foods. FDA now gets the authority to withdraw an exemption from a farm or facility that has been associated with a foodborne illness outbreak. As we have learned over the past few months, the FDA's resources have been severely limited and as a result rarely inspects food facilities and farms and in some cases not at all. Food illnesses sicken 76 million Americans and actually kills 5,000 each year. That according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Three pathogens, Salmonella, E. coli, and Listeria are responsible for an estimated 112,500 illnesses and over 900 deaths. This legislation affects every citizen of this country on a daily basis as it substantially modifies the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act and generally gives the FDA better funding, better authority and the ability to monitor the safety of our food supply. The bill provides the FDA a process for quicker and more effective action against food companies that don't adequately protect against food safety risks. There's little doubt that we are better off with it than without it, but it is still not enough. In Retail Trends, we take a look at a supermarket guru consumer panel on the role of dietitians. 
Retailers take note. 47% of our consumer panel said they would be more likely to shop in their local supermarket if there was a dietitian present. Respondents said that they could use the help of a nutrition professional mostly in packaged goods, fresh meats, seafood, and produce. Shopping for a diet-related health condition is a concern of 60%, and 66% would seek a dietitian's guidance for improving nutrition. 46% said they would seek them out to help with weight loss. The majority of consumers say they would use a dietitian in store. So what are we waiting for? And another important benefit is counseling and empowering all store associates. So not only can they carry the messages to shoppers 24 seven, but improve their own health as well. For all you travelers out there who just can't leave the Twinkies at home, get ready for this extreme retail story. Snack lovers may have just met their match. In a hotel in Germany's River Rhine, the food hotel offers the next best thing to actually sleeping in the supermarket snack aisle. With furniture that looks like cans in the reception area, stools that are made of beer crates, and cushions that are shaped like biscuits, this place may well be a snack food lover's idea of heaven. 36 of Germany's largest snack food brands, including Dr. Oetker, Chio, Ferrero, and the brewer Veltins, have teamed up with the food hotel to design and to create this unique destination. According to the hotel's manager, Peter Grunheiser, we have found sponsors from the industry for all the rooms and gave them basic guidelines. But within those, we allowed them complete freedom and the opportunity to let their creative imagination and juices run wild. Food companies contributed funds towards the construction of the hotel and for the furnishings in the rooms that they designed. As you might guess, the hotel favorite and quite possibly John Travolta's is the room designed by German crisp manufacturer Chio, in which their guests can feast on potato snacks while dancing away under a rotating mirror disco ball or under flashing lights in the bathroom while grooving to the music playing from the room's integrated sound system. The hotel also has its own full-blown supermarket and a guest reception where patrons relax on chairs that look like shopping carts. A double room costs about 129 euros, that's $180 per night. This is one of those retail environments that I only hope does not cross the Atlantic. In Consumer Trends, we seek out the insights of Brian Wansick, co-director of the Cornell Center for Behavioral Economics and Child Nutrition Programs, a question that many nutritionists, educators, and CPG marketers would love the answer to is, quote, how can we direct consumers to eat healthier without them realizing it? Well, there are some stores out there that are figuring out just how to reach shoppers' desires to eat better, and they've identified the challenges in doing so. Hi, Brian. Thanks for joining us this morning. Oh, it's great to be with you today. Thanks. A few months ago, we reported on your study that compared the average basket price in expensive grocery stores to less expensive stores and then compared them to the shopper's BMI. What exactly did you discover? One of the things we ended up finding is that the higher a person's BMI, the more they were uh, spending at the lower price stores. But the lower the BMI, the more they are spending at higher, more expensive stores. So it wasn't that either group of people was spending a lot less money in food. It's where they were spending their money at. So what would happen in your mind if you look into your crystal ball and we took people with a high BMI and sent them to expensive stores, and then we took the people with the low BMIs and sent them to the discount stores? What we end up finding is sort of a suppression of how much they, they spent. The, the people who were the, um, uh, the, the, the low BMI people going to the inexpensive stores wouldn't be finding a lot of the high-end but uh, you know, relatively healthy stuff that they might otherwise buy. So they're just not going to buy it. They're going to spend a whole lot less because they're not finding what they want. Brian, what are some of the in-store tricks to getting shoppers to purchase more vegetables, for example? You know, one of, the, one of the remarkably easy things we found is we did a great study looking at multiple unit prices. You know, uh, two for $2, uh, you know, you know uh, apples, 12 uh, for $4. These, these multiple unit prices 
have an amazing impact on how much people buy. So what can consumers do to consciously make better and healthier choices? A number of things that you can do is, is to earmark a portion of your shopping cart for nothing more than fruits and vegetables and uh, maybe perishables you might otherwise like. Okay, Say, I'm going to fill up this part of the cart. Because what it ends up doing, it ends up giving you a benchmark or a reference point about how much you should be putting in. Um, another thing you can do is go to the fresh fruit and vegetable aisle first, and then the canned or frozen vegetable and fruit aisle second. We find that a person's 11% more likely to buy the first things they see than they are the later, later things they see. We did this really cool study <clears throat> in a series of grocery stores around D.C., for one thing we end up finding is that regardless of what's in the first aisle of a grocery store, people end up being dramatically more likely to buy something in the first aisle, in the second aisle, the second aisle, in the third aisle, and so forth. So what do you suggest to manufacturers or brands who find themselves in that ninth or tenth aisle? Oh, <laughs> you're so out of luck. No, <laughs> if you have your choice, take your highest margin items the highest margin healthier items, preferably. And if there's any way you can get them in the first aisle, you're, you're going to be in, in a lot more luck. If not, end caps are better than being buried in the middle of the ninth aisle. Brian, as always, great chatting with you. Thanks so much for joining us. You can find a lot more on the website, mindlesseating.org. Thanks again, Brian. For more on Brian's work, just click on the link to my left. Our health and wellness story today looks at dieting. It's the time of the year when many Americans decide that with the new year, it's time to resolve to lose weight and to get in shape. January brings thousands of TV and magazine advertisements touting weight loss gimmicks and programs. The new shows are preparing their diet reports and comparisons. New diet apps will launch soon, and scores of diet books hit the shelves and even download on our iPads and Kindles. To curb that holiday weight gain, drinking water before meals and before grocery shopping may help to curb impulse shopping and eating. Dieters have been encouraged for years to employ this trick with the simple reasoning that water fills our bellies, thus reducing hunger, caloric intake, and keeps cravings at bay. But does drinking water before a meal really help you lose weight? Well, yes and no. A randomized trial published in the journal Obesity just this year by researchers at Virginia Tech followed a group of overweight subjects aged 55 and above on low-calorie diets for about three months. Half of them were instructed to drink two cups of water before each meal, and at the end of the study, the water group had lost an average of 4.5 more pounds than the non-water group. Yet another study demonstrated a 13% reduction in caloric intake in overweight subjects who drank water before breakfast. So we had to wonder, what about encouraging people to increase their water intake, especially before grocery shopping? Could that help to curb impulse buying? Here's the anomaly. We all know it's important to not visit the supermarket when we're hungry. Shopping hungry actually increases impulse shopping, but it turns out to be true for just normal weight adults. Overweight individuals actually bought more food when they had recently eaten than if they did hungry. For Food News Today, I'm Phil Lempert. Thanks for joining us. Next week's Password and Stories will be emailed to you next Tuesday morning.